Beautiful. I think we're landed in the space and yeah, I'll pass it over to Mark uh, to get us started with this Q&A. And yeah, I wish everybody a beautiful session here. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Yes. I welcome everybody. It's such a delight to see so many, so many faces turning up for this, what's going to be a very exciting and revealing Q&A session with the filmmakers of Tamara. My name is Mark J. Francis. I'm a film director, producer, and I'm a story consultant. And I had the pleasure of working with the uh, filmmakers, John, Ian and Julia over a couple of year period to help craft the story um, of the jewels that they uncovered during their several year immers immersive experience in Tamera, um, which is why I have been lucky enough to be the host of today. And I'm going to introduce um, the filmmakers to you all. Um, this is, we're, make, we're making the assumption that everyone here has had the chance to uh, what have already seen the film. Um, perhaps some of you have now participated in some of the events that's been happening online in the summit, or you've already had direct experience with Tamara itself. Um, and all of your questions are welcome. So feel free as we go to drop a question in the chat. And I will keep an eye on those questions. Um, I'll start the session uh, with a couple of my own questions. And then I'll start weaving in some of the questions that uh, you are dropping into the chat as we move along. So um, without any further hesitation, I would like to introduce um, the three uh, filmmakers. Ian McKenzie. Where are you, Ian? Just booting up my booting expensive up. camera. <laughs> there you are, coming out from the darkness into the light. I can see it and feel it. And let's introduce Julia Marianska and John Wolfstone. Mm -hmm. Greetings, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Hello. They're Welcome. about to be pinned. They'll be about to be pinned here on the stage as well. Dan will be adding them up here. Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Lovely to see you all again. Just to say that this is the first time that the four of us have come together in quite some time. There's been various Q&As happening around the world and there's been different configurations of everybody participating in those sessions. But this is the first time the four of us have had the chance to be together. So that's really exciting for us because it's been a big journey to get to this point. And we're just feeling really excited that we've now actually arrived at a point where we can have a film with a powerful story and a powerful message that we can share with the audience worldwide. So let me start off first um, by asking a couple of questions to you all. Um, my first question really is, um, and I suppose, you know, all three of you um, have a slightly different entry point into this question. So uh, keep, keep, keep them as brief as you can, because I would love all three of your perspectives on this. But um, I would like to know, um, perhaps starting with John, um, for you, where did the first contact come from? Why, what was happening? Where were you in your life? What were you looking for um, that led you to this moment of saying, I want to make this commitment to this community in terms of really understanding it and then making a film about it? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, you know, it was actually almost exactly 10, uh, 10 uh, years ago that I was actually in Jordan working in a uh, refugee camp during the Syrian civil war. And I had gone to this peace research village with Palestinians and um, Israelis, and I got a book from Tamara. And then I put it in my backpack. I didn't really know who they were. And then I was working in this camp, seeing the horrors of war every single day. And at night, I started reading this book. And I started reading about this peace culture, this group of people that were researching peace and trying to understand that if they were, if we were, if we were really going to create a global culture of peace, we had to actually model that ourselves and how we actually live. Because it's, it, it's one thing to go out there and protest about war, but another thing to actually do the inner work also in community around actually stopping the war in us 
and uh, between people. And later that year, I went to uh, Himera and I had a terrible time the first 10 days. It was not, they, what they were doing was hard. And I only ended up staying because they were offering this five day love school. And once I went to this love school, my whole uh, perspective changed. And I found like, oh, this deep longing I had for love in my life and like the, you know, series of failures I had, the massive heartbreaks I had, like the healing of those had everything to do with also creating this peace culture. And that connection point totally uh, awoke something in me and then kind of became a synchronistic thread of meeting Ian and meeting Julia and the rest started to uh, unfold. So that's my entry point. So essentially, at the beginning, you were looking at this from a geopolitical perspective in terms of activism in relation to peace. Yes. And then as you entered into Tamara, it became deeply personal. And then it was looking at your inner relationship to others and yourself and where those conflicts and peace moments lie. And obviously, yeah. there's a story that then gets to unfold from that point onwards. OK, yeah. thank you for that. Um, Julia, how about you? Uh, so the question is, what what was my entry point? To what was your entry point? How did you first make contact um, with Tamara? Yeah. What brought you to Tamara and what brought you to this film? Yeah, well, when I was 25, I moved to San Francisco from living in New York City. And I uh, immersed myself in a lot of radical places and communities, including an intentional community called One Taste, which was very focused with um, on sexuality, very urban community, 50 people. And after that, I lived in a more um, homestead kind of intentional community with four families. And so I was really, really interested in intentional community. And in my own, um, in my own journey, I had heard about Tamara first when I was at Burning Man for the first time, <laughs> somebody speaking about it on a panel. And then I later met John and he and Ian had been to Tamara and started already making the film. And then John helped to produce um, a love school in California where I, I, when I first had contact with Tamara and it wasn't until the maybe six months later when I, when I visited Tamara for the first time, um, when I was like 29 in my Saturn return, I took a one-way ticket traveling the world and um, ended up in the global love school. And then these two were there and they invited me to be part of their film team. And I'd been a filmmaker and so it was synchronistic and also really um, in line with my, my path of intrigue with sexuality and healing and how, how does that happen communally and um, so that was the entry point. So John and Ian were already in the early, they were already starting the film, weren't they? At that, that point when you met them. Yeah, uh, right. And then they decided to invite you in to become like, to, to, to be the third kind of musketeer, creative musketeer of the project. What was it that they... That's right. <laughs> what was it that you <laughs> felt like they wanted? What was that extra bit? component that they were looking for um that you yeah. felt they that that you could then support with in that journey that they were undergoing um well at the time I was um as a photographer and also a filmmaker really exploring a more sensual way of filming um and I think they recognized my aesthetic and invited me as somebody who could lend that to the film aesthetically. Um, and from there, there was a synergy between us also that um, I think they also recognized that as two men, they <laughs> maybe needed a female body person on their team to balance out some of the issues that we were trying to explore. You know, we're exploring um, healing between the sexes in, in the film. That was the original the original entry point. And so I think they recognized they couldn't do that alone. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and to Ian, tell me about how, how it began, how, where, it, where you were and how you found this Tamara idea mm -hmm. and why you should have pursued it. 
Well, I've uh, started filmmaking in my I don't know, early twenties, and uh, after a bit of exploration, and I did a film about a friend who worked a job week for a year. I got really curious as film as a medium for uh, evolution, revolution, and shifting consciousness. And so for me, like that's how I was entering into film. Uh, you know, it, sort of the medium itself was a bit of the it just happened to be that. Um, but I feel like I started swimming upstream to to be like, what happened? How did we get here? I worked on a film, Occupy Love, with the director, Belcour Ripper. And again, that's this stream of, of like, what is this evolutionary impulse that wants to break through this um, destructive arc of, of modern culture that is, you know, rapidly heading off a cliff? And so that I following, following that stream, I also connected with Charles Eisenstein at the time. I did a film, The Revolution is Love and Sacred Economics, based on his book. And so I think that caught the eye of Tamara around that time. They were like, oh, we could use a film kind of like Sacred Economics, you know, that sort of succinctly um, covers the, the, the transmission of what they're up to. So I received an invite and it wasn't for a couple more years that I kind of took it seriously. It was actually the end of my marriage that was the sort of deciding factor. And I'll say I um, kind of crashed and burned in love for a multitude of reasons. And for me, again, in that uh, afterwards in the heartbreak, I was deeply curious, like, what didn't I know about what happened with that separation? I'll also say that I do believe it's the intelligence of Eros that brought us together as a team that, you know, John was in Tamara and they said, hey, you should, you know, go to meet this guy in Canada. And, you know, he actually saw a film I did about Stephen Jenkinson. And he so he got curious and came to Canada, which I met him there. And he didn't know I'd be there. And it was, this, you know, these, these synchronistic moments of, hey, you know, we're supposed to go make a film. Uh, and as far as Julia and the intelligence of Eros, she was making a film about love as well. And that was also what brought us together. And I'll just say, you know, clearly as well that we became lovers for a time, uh, Julia and I, which is also and part of that. And John, <laughs> separately, we should say, uh, as in distinctly. And for me, that's such a beautiful part of the story that um, I think when I think about Eros as an intelligence, this this attraction right, is, is true. And it, it's for different reasons, right? And when that attraction, the, the just purity of attraction is distorted or demonized, like it's not made curious about that. Oftentimes we can confuse it as like, oh, this is supposed to be a, you know, a certain way as opposed to, well, let's explore actually what's here. Let's explore this Eros. Uh, let's explore it sexually. You know, how does that feel? And, you know, is that, does that feel true? Um, and for how long does it feel true? But wait a second, now it wants to shift again, and it wants to be an actual binding uh, solidarity between us, which is actually what I feel was the emergent um, intelligence, that it kind of brought us into a willingness to deeply move through what we had to, to uh, be in service to this film. And so um, that's a part, you know, again, we don't talk about as much, you know, publicly, but at the same time is crucial, actually, to understand this particular um, committed cauldron that we were in for you know, the better part of a decade. Mm, thank you. And I think that's what I think is um, evident about the experience is the fact that, you know, it was an immersive experience that you threw yourselves in as filmmakers to be participants um, of the experience um, and to, you know, try as best you can to embody uh, what Tamara was or is uh, teaching and practicing and then to find a way to communicate that experience through the film itself um so yeah thank you for sharing that Ian um I think what I would like to find out from all of you I've got a question choose choose which ones can answer this one is that you know I've it, and this came up a lot in our creative process was um trying to recognize the degree to which uh and this was a massive debate that we were having in the editing process um and therefore i want to bring it to everybody here tonight is the degree to which you um the the, the degree i don't like this I don't like to use this word balance but the degree to which one could explore what the shadows are of tamara um that there was a lot of light that you projected on the community and it was a lot of light that you experienced and that was so much of what your film was about um was you you know creating a pot you know wanting to put out there a positive image 
of Tamara as a model, uh, as an example of um, how we can live differently um, and how we can relate differently. Um, but there are those shadow elements that, that exist that didn't get that kind of attention in the film. And um, nothing's perfect in life and nor is Tamara. So I would just be interested to put the question out to you about somewhere about your journey, about where, again, different for all of you, um, but maybe perhaps uh, John can speak to this first. Um, where you were, John, with where, where you're, you know, because you, you, I know that you were all going through your own experiences of embracing things, questioning things, coming back to early ideas, can you speak, John, to this? Where, where, you know, your what can you offer now when you talk about your film and also your own relationship of understanding to both the good and the bad of of, of what exists in Tamara? Yeah, you know, I think we approach this pretty not uh, conventionally as filmmakers, um, and we really also had to. I mean, one, we immediately became students of. Tamara. And in some ways we had to really drink the Kool-Aid, uh, so to speak, to be able to understand fully what they were doing. I mean, fully, but as best as we could. And also to really gain access to them sharing their more intimate stories with us. And, you know, I think this film, and we've said this prior, is really a love letter. And in that sense, you know, I think about, I just was on a panel with Benjamin, who's one of the main uh, characters in the film. And we had an interview with Sabine yesterday. Like, I love these people. And so I think the film, it actually comes to me now as like something that it's similar. You would say about somebody at like a funeral in that for sure, Tamara has its shadows and we saw some of it. But I feel like what was transmitting through us was our love. And that just didn't feel as important to share. And Tamara certainly has been through a hard time. And actually, tomorrow, we're having a panel with them at the same time, talking about kind of the shadowy journey they've been on since the film ended. And we did happen to film in what we kind of call the uh, Tamara heyday. And, you know, I think looking back, we've all agreed that you know, doing it all over um, again, maybe we would have included a bit more shadow or asked different kind of questions. But at the same time, I actually believe looking at the film now that this is the film that the world needs because I feel that there's been so much about community, around cults, around groups of people coming together to try to live differently in just the drama of it. And the thing is, Tamara like despite all the shadows all the like difficulty it flipping works like they are still surviving almost 50 years after they started and that's because they have a pretty unique ability to accept feedback not always not perfectly you know it takes often a long time but even now hearing how they've changed since we've been there we hear them digesting that feedback and i think for us the feedback we wanted to show to them and to the world was this is phenomenal and so needed and they're not going to hit it fully like right but i think eventually that just uh outweighed any sense that they wanted to spend a lot of energy highlighting how they're fucking up which they certainly are and you know uh um they're always uh, learning from and changing thank you john ian just to build on that a bit, I mentioned Occupy Love earlier, the film, which is about the first year of the Occupy movement and a number of like spiritual perspectives infused from different teachers um, around the world. And this was the director of Velcro Ripper's vision. And one of the critiques that came out around that film when it first came out was it was very much the perspective of, of you could call it the pro-occupiers. And some people would say, well, how come you didn't interview the 1%? And uh, Velcro's comment to that was like, well, we hear the 1% everywhere. Like that's the that's the dominant narrative we're getting. And so the intimate look with inside a movement in this case, that people were able to touch with a certain now like uh, a compassion understanding of like what they were actually trying to do from within. 
And so for me, I, I recognize the same impulse in how we've uh, how we approach Tamara in that the opening quote of the film, which I don't know if you've seen yet, Mark, but the version that is now out to the world that people are seeing, there's a quote there that has guided me um, since you know the early days of the film, which is, uh, if you want people to build a ship, uh, don't send them out for nails or to gather planks of wood, but teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. And there's something in there, which to me, that is the intention for me, at least of the film is to, is to transmit the beauty and immensity of the sea. Like this, Charles Eisenstein might say, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Because ultimately that's more valuable than a kind of uh, journalistic takedown, right? Of uh, here's all the problems, you know, this is pretty good, but here's all the problems. And it's like, we knew that all of that would have space outside of the film. Uh, just like this, you know, just like, um, you know, articles and, and teachings and all that stuff that would get its space. But in terms of the film, what is the function of in the medium of film best for in this moment? So for me, it was to actually uplift and highlight and transmit and touch that place of deepest longing to awaken that in people. That to me is the most valuable thing that we could do in this moment. So again, intentional, um, but not necessarily a leaving out in a sense of trying to create a utopia, but more like there's something beyond the mind's desire to say, well, what about, what about, you know, below that is actually this heart's longing to actually, is something worth aspiring to. And when you talk about this longing, the longing for what? I would say longing for, I call it the endless immensity of the sea in a sense, but what what has come up even in the conversations already, you know, yesterday with Stephen Jenkinson and Pat McCabe was this deep, sense of the need to belong somewhere, right? To belong with people, to belong, uh, to place meaningfully, um, that that's at the root of so much, you know, dysfunction and so much strategy that people bring to control others, to control, you know, economics and finance, control resources, because they don't have this existential sense of, am I okay? Will I be held? And this is to me, this is the origin or the function of village at its core. And without that, again, or without people even understanding what that feels like, this is what the function of the film is in my uh, sense as well, is that we want people to feel what it's like to taste that in a different place as we did, as I did, right? Of like, well, this is what it's like to kind of, to belong somewhere again, this ancestral memory awakened again. And from there, all the strategies can unfold, right? Okay, now I got to learn these skills. Now I got to go uh, learn permaculture and, you know, okay, great. But it's like, if you don't have that ignition at the deepest core, oh, this is actually what, I need to point at, then I, I doubt you'll work for it because most people don't even know what to point at. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to carry on. If anyone's got any questions that they would like asked, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will take a look at them and bring them in um, as we go. Um, question actually is coming in while before we move on here. Um, so I have Marielle. Um, I'm going to ask Marielle's question. I wonder how, I wonder how they have approached the shadow of non-transparent hierarchy that was a shadow when I will last went in 2014. I love them for keeping going through all this turmoil that this work brings with it so the question about how they've approached the shadow of non-transparent hierarchy do you know what that means this mariel's obviously been to tamara um do you know I what she's referring to when she uses this term non-transparent hierarchy julia do you want to speak yeah, to that i can speak to it a little bit um just to say that i don't think we any of us have been to Tamara since 2019 when we last finished filming and um so then COVID hit and there's been since a very big excavation and looking at a lot of the shadow as you named that was non-transparent so um just last summer I happened to be showing the film um when we were in our festival circuit at a festival in Portugal with um, a young woman from Tamara who's featured in the film. And um, she spoke to some of this. And what I can say is that 
Tamara is very much in a transition of leadership right now. And so they've had to look at the hierarchy and the stronghold on leadership. Um, and as a result, there are some people in the founding generation who are holding on and don't want to let go of those power positions. And then there's younger generations that do want to come in and are ready for that. And so there's been, um, yeah, turmoil, forum, a lot of examination. A lot of people have left the community. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot, been a lot of humbling, I think, from those who've been in leadership. And um, they spoke to that. Um, ben and Sabina have spoke to that in the last days on the panels. And so what we see is, uh, you know, a community approaching their 50th anniversary who had to have a reckoning a bit. And I think that COVID actually granted them that closed door internal time to examine their structures that they hadn't been looking at because they're hosting guests for a majority of the year every year as a way of sustaining themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I also, also want to just build on that briefly. I want to build and actually build a bridge back to also what Ian was saying. Yeah, it's not, it's not so much actually building on that. It's really a bridge back that feels important to say is that as as Tamara shifts and uh, changes, I think what is probably staying true and what is at, for me, the core of that longing that brought me there and the longing in the film is when I've been to Tamara, especially when I go for a longer time, it is like stepping into a fairy tale. You know, all the way I feel like that people get lost in these worlds, whether that's Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter you know, there is a sense more than anywhere else on earth I have ever been to that Tamara is a more holistic and perhaps complete alternative reality that they've really created an ecosystem. And that to me is what's so different and what is so drawn because probably like most of us, it is painful to live in the like colonial death phobic, like uh, just the world that we are currently living in. Because each time I've tried to go create healing uh, endeavors, it always comes up against the larger order system of separation that it's in. And not that Tamara is totally free from that because they're still on planet Earth, but they have created a holistic culture that's more complex, and I'd say in like complete in that sense than elsewhere. And I think that is what really brought all of us because that is in some ways a model or like an acupuncture point for what a different reality on scale could be like. And for a me, it's been some of the most nourishing time actually being there. And certainly there are issues and shadows in it. And as Julia said, there is that capacity to keep being in an iterative process. And that's what Tamara says. They aren't actually complete because they are a research community. And I think that frame is perhaps what separates them from being a cult, that they that they are not set on their ideas as forged or completed, but they are constantly iterating, knowing new information comes as time and other like diversity comes in. Thank you, John. <clears throat> I'd like to move this conversation on now to the subject of free love, given that it's such an important component at Tamara. And when I was there, um, spending quite a bit of time um, researching um, for a film project, which I abandoned in favor of Ian and Julia and John to make theirs. Um, <laughs> Why, thank you, Mark. Their pleasure. Uh, a real pleasure. I, I'm so pleased you did that, not me. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, and really exploring and, and asking them what free love is, I found it um, near the, the 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 kind of the common def definition that, that I was being told was that from their point of view, free love means, they use this word free love. Um, but for me, I think conscious love feels more of a term that I think it is potentially more um, resonant with what they mean by free love. So free love is defined as this idea of being able to love free from fear. And how often do we find ourselves in love relationships where the fear of speaking our truth to the other um, is so high 
that we choose not to. Um, so in and and the form that that might take. So the, in essence, it doesn't mean if you practice free love, therefore you're in some kind of open relating polyamorous dynamic. You could be in an open relationship. And actually what's coming up within you is to call in monogamy. But the fear of you speaking to your partner and speaking that truth and say, what I need right now in my life is to have a monogamous relationship is the cost could be you could lose that relationship. So you suppress aspects of yourself out of fear in favor of trying to maintain some kind of status quo. And then it can flip the other way. It could be in a monogamous dynamic and you want to start, you, you as, as, as Ian mentioned at the beginning of this call, the eros can flow. There is a, there's a kind of, attraction that wants to come through and explore itself but the fear of us bringing those attractions into committed relationships the consequences can be quite in certainly in our in our world outside of places like Tamira the consequences can be huge another example could be um, celibacy that um, to remain and to call in for a period of um being celibate for a while, we can end up in long relationships where the sex drive um, diminishes, but we don't bring consciousness to that. And maybe there's a wisdom in, in, in what, what that can mean for oneself to consciously call in a period of celibacy rather than go through a period of avoidance. But to speak that in a relationship with somebody, it could be, it could be understood as rejection and so on and so forth. So the work around that deep wounding of the fear of abandonment and rejection and how sacred that wound is and how far back that goes ancestrally is a big component of what happens in Tamera. It's a big component about how so a lot of these circles, these forums get together around this particular wounding. Um, so um, that's as I understood what free love meant to them. And it appears that the majority of people in the form of that expression seems to have a primary relationship and a lover network as it's called um but and that's all well held within the the the, the village of of uncles and aunts and and men circles and women circles um so my question to uh the three of you is and I'll I'll start with Julia because um Julia is currently making a film at the moment um, that has been documenting her own personal journey um, in the, if you like, on the a free love journey that she's been on um, for many, many years. Um, so what I'd like to ask you, Julia, is how did the, how did you coming into contact with Tamara and their, um, their practice and ideology around free love inform where you were, inform choices that you were going to make at that point in your life what are we talking about eight years ago before you were a mother before you were married um it was a big turning point can you can you give some insight into what was the difference between what you were understanding about polyamory culture within california versus the context of being in, in Tamara and how they were talking about the subject of free love and how that impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> okay. How to keep this brief. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, I can say that at the time that I came to Tamara, I had just come out of a serious five-year relationship in which I was engaged to be married and we were practicing polyamory, but I would say more than polyamory, we were practicing free sexuality because it was at the end of my relationship when my partner really fell in love with another woman that I, I couldn't handle it. I didn't have a framework within which I could really understand how to hold that. It felt much more consequential and threatening to have love involved than just sexuality. And at the time they were in these silos for me. Um, and um, I, I came to Tamara on a journey um, of 
being kind of a solo woman lover and and kind of made a commitment to myself to say, okay, I'm going to make an experiment for myself that I'm going to, to allow myself to fall in love or have, you know, whatever that meant, have feelings, infatuation, all that without necessarily future projecting that this person is now going to be the, the my partner forever or the father of my child or what we're going to just allowing myself to kind of take that off the table and coming to Tamara because you asked originally about free love like what does it mean and the best the best um so free love I think in the dominant culture means kind of polyamory and having sex right and with a lot of people but for them, it's a sort of annotated version of this longer phrase, love free of fear, violence, and lies. And because they're a peace research village, um, for them, they're really taking these topics seriously to research them. And and I took that on for myself. Is like, okay, actually recognizing how much more permission and safety I felt to explore that personal mission that I came there with in the context of a community and in a context of a, a group of people who were sharing a sense of consciousness around how to hold those energies. So in the in the outside world where I would have where I was, you know, I had other friends who were experimenting with free sexuality or polyamory. It wasn't necessarily conscious community holding it all together. Tamara is a very special, different kind of place where people are really intentionally bringing these questions in and then linking them to these bigger political questions. And so I, I can say that a lot of um, that exploration in uh, being this open-hearted person and also trusting my body would tell me when it was I mean, I can say too, like there's a vulner, there was a vulnerability and there were moments where I could have sex and it was like, that was great. Thank you. And then there's a moment when like something deeper gets touched and it's very vulnerable. And then like, how do I trust myself to create the conditions around a pace and an agreement field and, and, and going um, not farther than can really um be sustained and so I think all these levels of awareness started to come in whereas maybe like a, a very earlier adolescent version of me was was simply exploring or maybe rebelling because it wasn't allowed when I was being brought up and so I think that um probably many people come through their own layers and and so these were some of mine um and there's so much more to say but I I will say that just as a moment for because how it's informed my life now and like I live now for the first time in a nuclear setting I have a partner I have a five-year-old daughter and it is much harder for me to practice free love without a surrounding context that holds that with me um, it feels like the dominant culture and the um, the privacy there's too much at stake. It feels like, again, like without a net around of people who share practice, share consciousness, feels like too much of a risk to dis to disrupt. Um, and I can say more, but I think that's plenty to open <laughs> more questions, perhaps. Mm, thank you, thank you, Julia. Um, how uh, and how about you, John? What's your has that influenced does that play a role now post Tamara you know you're not living in Tamara outside of Tamara now how much of a role does that play in your decisions about your way of relating relationships now you mean the concept of free love yes mm -hmm. yeah I mean I've been on a pretty humbling journey with it you know mm -hmm. I just in general with Tamara, both as a village, as a vision, free love, 2015, 2016, when this was all starting, I was really flying the flag. And I was like, I'm going to start a village. 
it's going to be like, you know, free love paradise. <laughs> and I was in my 20s and um, we actually tried. Me and Julia have been part of a group of people trying to build village a couple of times that hasn't led to village. Me and Ian were also part of a group that tried to like take next steps and they were all important research. That's the thing. We always approached it as like research containers. So they were valuable in that sense. And it was like, still to this day, I don't really know how to, or I know in some ways how Tamara did what they did. I just don't know how we on this side fully get there. And I'm still researching that now. And I want to do that with all the other people here, which is why we created this film and have this online uh, uh, school uh, platform for people to join and like connect. We want to be in that ongoing uh, research. And with Free Love, wow, Mark, I mean, I didn't really recognize the depth of it until I got into a committed partnership about four or five years ago. And I went deep and to the point of almost becoming married and planning kids. And, you know, the gap between my ideals and what my nervous system, what my like somatic body could actually handle was so great that I, I was the one that was like, we need to be monogamous or I can't, or, or I can't stay. <laughs> and, and that was true. But looking back, it was, that wasn't the only thing that broke us. And I'm not with that uh, person now, but there's something interesting because and it's a really tricky place because there is the both and that that was true, but that probably means I shouldn't have been in that uh, partnership in general, instead of me trying to grip to create the safety, because ultimately the, for, and for me, the biggest insight is like, love to me which i think this whole film and there was a while we were thinking about calling the film love school it's been a really big school of like love and i feel like that to really love where i'm sitting now is to want to truly know somebody fully and it doesn't mean that i won't have boundaries or i won't have needs or things but there was a place where actually i wanted to love this woman she was a, a female bodied human to the place except where she might love other men. That was like the limit on my own capacity at that time to love. And, you know, we've been broken up for almost like three years and I'm still having insights of digesting that place in me that still loves her, that is opening now to loving her as she loves other men, which is certainly happening now that we're apart. And so... I can't also say that, you know, I think I'm in my own interesting point where I think for sure I will create the containers that I and my partner or partners need for safety. And I know I won't again necessarily just follow that same fear response. Even if that is the truth of my nervous system, I think I'll look for a different answer than trying to be like, no, now we are closed and you can't go there because that it didn't because I guess what I'm trying to say is that I never actually felt safer, even though we were monogamous. And I think and I've seen that again and again, I think Ian can speak also to his like uh, journey. I don't actually know if being monogamous fully creates that. I mean, I think it does to an extent, but at the same time, my psychology and my body were still running all the fear patterns. And there is something in there where I think actually community was going to be the only answer. And what essentially our partnership was too deep for what both our nervous systems could handle without more community. And that's where right now I want partnership so badly in my life, but I want community even more. And it's a big shift in me still for 10 years doing this to not just unconsciously prioritize romantic relationships. It's so easy to do that in our culture. And I've done that at the cost of the friendships, which might be building the threads of community that actually get me the bigger dream. Um, yeah, so I'll pause there and see if, you know, I guess Ian probably wants to have his take on this question too. Thank you, John. I really appreciate you sharing that because like, I'm very aware of the kind of wild journey you've been on with doing this. And I think it's so important to highlight the fact 
but so much of what's happening in Tamera is being done in the container of village. And there's moments in the film, you know, there's a particular moment when somebody talks about the um, the workshop where they go to um, uh, return clothes and share clothes and fix clothes. So, you know, you're already in this space of freeing love. You're, you're living in a village and you're living in a community. You're already on some level starting to think about we rather than me. Um, it's it's our clothes, it's our heating, it's our land, it's our food, it's our relationship to nature, it's our relationship to each other. And you come out of, of a community environment in a nuclear situation, nuclear family situation, and it's me and it's mine and it's I, and that makes it even harder to, to slowly um, open up the you know the lotus of love if you like when the vibration resonance around you is is completely uh, against the essence of what it means to live live so open-heartedly and freely uh, they do say after uh, the intro week when i did the intro week, they said don't try this at home uh so <laughs> unless you're trying to build community and you're integrating this notion of free love across your relationship to money and your relationship to land and your relationship to spirit, not just keeping it focused on um, your relationship to sex and love. How about you, Ian? What's your, you've also been on a big journey with this one. And I know that this is a very um, you know, potent subject for you. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I could say a number of things and also, you know, I'm aware we've spent a good amount of time on this question, so maybe I'll be brief, but I also feel like I could weave it in with uh, one of the prompts that was asked or one of the questions that was asked in the chat. Um, I'll sketch a bit of my journey with this is, I, so I was married, as I think I named earlier, and we were in a relationship for 10 years and we opened the relationship at my prompting uh, near the end of that time for a number of reasons, um, which I won't get into here, but we opened the relationship, uh, began exploring with other people. This is all pre Tamara, of course. And uh, she ultimately fell in love with another, which is a very common thing, right? When you kind of open the Pandora's box in a relationship and, you know, you might say, okay, just sex, but no falling in love, which is, you know, never uh, possible to control. And uh, she fell in love with someone else, fell deeply uh, for them. And uh, they became pregnant, actually. So, there's a piece there and, and then there's a whole backstory about why that was actually such a phenomenal thing. But ultimately she chose this other man and I was still open at that point to be like, okay, wow, this is big, but what do you, what do you want actually? You know, I was sort of open, even though I had no models at that point, I was still open to say, what do you want? And she was like, well, I, I, I want to be with this other man. And I never forget what she said to me though. She said the way she phrased it was because I don't think I can love more than one person. Hmm. Right. There was something in there like that. And and how I then understood that, you know, even later was it's like when you're in a construct around possession and ownership and belonging into another person, uh, which it so often is in this culture, then it's like you only have one slot for that person. Right. That's it. It's just one slot. And so if somebody is in the slot, uh, somebody else cannot be in the slot. Right. In, in that paradigm. And so I kind of understood that. I was like, okay, wow. Um, so I took my leave and, and left. And I swung quite hard in the other direction, went into polyamory, uh, open relating with a partner for five years, went very deep in that regard. And again, made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of learning, and ultimately left that partnership as well because she had another partner as well. And I just didn't quite feel like it was true for us to remain. We were domestic partners um, at the time. And then I met my current partner, who was also the mother of my child. We have a five-year-old as well. And that started again in, you know, high, high passion and, uh, and deep, you know, erotic connection. And also again, uh, moved so fast that, you know, all of the, maybe the things that would have been known had to be slowed down a bit to be like, Oh, that's your trauma. This is my trauma showing up. You know, we could have approached it with more consciousness and maybe if community had been there to be like, okay, see the beautiful sparks, but like, let's slow it down a bit. That might've been helpful of which, you know, village mindedness is also a place to mediate that level of intensity because it can, you know, it can set things in motion uh, too quickly before they could be sustained. And so this partnership has largely been, yeah, deep learning and journey. And um, we have been monogamous for that time, uh, often, you know, around this tender age of young child, you know, couples can choose to do this. 
for that reason to create like more of a just a protected space. And at the same time, I've found that uh, as I've leaned into this question as well, like, you know, how do we how do we hold this uh, spirit of free love or love free from fear, but also be in a, contain a conscious containership, you know, at the same time. And for me, what I've kind of arrived at, and I can just sketch it here is a sense that um, opening the doors to to the high energies of Eros and and this kind of exploration without the ecosystem of support as what we've been talking about here is just very dangerous because again, big energies get unleashed. You know, if you're not in a committed field of people who are in solidarity that can help people move through, you know, attachment traumas and and give feedback and and all these things, which is pretty much the field of, of polyamory in the West, right? Um, they don't have these ecosystems of support. Maybe you have people that, you know, you get along with and you, you know, interest groups and you have good parties with, you know, but not that level of deep, committed, ongoing solidarity, it seems to me. I haven't really seen it. And so without that, I think there is something else though, which maybe you can call it conscious monogamy, right? There's maybe a phrase that has come up around this. And for me, the difference there is unconscious monogamy means, you know, all the shadows and kind of hidden layers and things are not really dealt with intentionally. Sure. Um, and then conscious monogamy is the ability to bring all that to it and also say, and exploring with others, you know, kind of free form is a bit too far. It's just going to create too much mayhem for us. Um, so that's really the practice that I sort of in, in this moment. And that last thing I will say though, around this question, this is where it links to what was spoken in the chat. Um, she's, Cindy had said, uh, you know, there, what about the rejection of someone who's in the free love community and nobody wants them, right? Or maybe you know, nobody wants them sexually. And this links to what I was saying because, and Tamara, um, there was a whole scene that we um, we removed. It just, you know, again, we tried it. Um, it didn't quite work out to just, it was maybe too edgy or just a little far beyond what we wanted to cover in the main film, but it covers their temple of love, which is uh, also affectionately known as the bodega in the community. And uh, it's a it's a place that's run by the wise women, and it's a place where uh, community members can go for different kinds of healing, different kinds of um, erotic sexual encounters held within the context of community that can provide um, a kind of uh, yeah a kind of nourishment, a, a kind of research and and healing that again, outside of the matrix of needing to play a game, uh, the game of like attraction and hierarchy and seduction. And all of these ways in which, um, right, in this culture, either you, let's say for a man who's maybe, you know, not viable, uh, will either go to a prostitute, right, or lose themselves in uh, pornography online because they fail at the game of, of you know, how to, uh, quote, attract a mate in this system. Whereas somewhere like Tamara, my understanding and experience was there's a place held for them that they can go for this kind of healing with folks who are trained in this process of love service. And it's held in high regard in the community. Right? It's not kept in the shadows. And they're, they're, it's from that spirit of service because the organism as a whole um, is interconnected. And so healing, you know, one member's healing is connected with the whole. And so for me, that's you don't have the same kind of um, kind of binds or, or, or sense of rejections when there is a place for them. Again, but it's, it's within a completely different kind of uh, containment than most of us can understand or have used to in the dominant culture. Hmm. Mm. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Well, Mark, I'm also wondering if you want to share briefly, because I feel like meeting us and getting involved with this film also did a interesting number on your own love life. I'm wondering if you want to share at all. Any, any maybe just like insights that you learned in your own ongoing research as well? Yeah, well, I'm, I'll bring it in briefly. Um, I tend to learn through experience for my sins. Um, so when people say don't do it, I tend to do it. So I went to Tamera and <laughs> I um, was very interested in this subject of free love. And um, I was, um, I think, you know, I spent a lot of my time when I was there, when I was reflecting on this subject, not about what it would mean for me to be able to explore it um, with others, but what it would mean for me to witness my partner um, uh, exploring it successfully with others in the way I was seeing other um, women who were in relationships uh, with their lover networks. And, um, you know, that was a really hard thing for me to really sit with. And I noticed in me um, somatically a uh, tremendous amount of fear and and some kind of ancestral patriarchal um, fear. 
um, it was coming beyond beyond my existence in this world. And I think that's one of the things that I noticed in Tamara that I had a lot of respect for. I really felt there was a very strong, um, some kind of uh, like a really strong feminine empowerment uh, in a way that I wasn't kind of seeing outside of Tamara. Women um, kind of expressed themselves, I felt, what I saw was completely free from any kind of shame or potential guilt or, or anything like that. Um, and that was extremely, on the one hand, um, extremely exciting. On the other hand, I just noticed myself feeling some fear around that, if I'm really honest with you. And I consider myself to be an extremely open, liberal person. So I did, that was tapping into some real deep ancestral ancestral patterns um, that were shown up for me when I was living in Tamara. Um, and I didn't appreciate enough how the circles that are, people are constantly in a circle. I mean, some people, every other day, they're in some form of circle. They might be in a spontaneous men's circle. They might be in a spontaneous women's circle. They might be in a circle with their micro village that they live in. They might be in a big community circle. Or whenever there's a piece of work that needs to be done, especially around this issue, it comes into circle. You immediately get witnessed. You immediately get invited into addressing these fears or these somatic feelings that suddenly come forth and they get listened to and they get held. Um, the support network is extraordinary. And some of these comments in, that are coming through about this feeling of rejection and how do you handle it? I think that's the space where I felt that it can be handled and held. Not to mention the relationship between the community uh, and nature itself and the spirit of nature. Um, and that was very, that, that like mother nature really holding all of this in a really profound way, I think has a, has a, he, has, has a tremendous healing quality. So when I came and left Tamara on my Tamara high, thinking I can try this at home, I did, and it didn't go down well at all. It was a complete disaster. And all those fears and all the traumas and the somatic things that I was feeling inside me, um, I managed to manifest externally and things got quite unpleasant and very, um, very, very traumatic and stressful. <clears throat> so um, I kind of learned somatically that there is, that this is, for me, I kind of, was starting to call in this idea about prioritizing the calling of community um, and and why, what, 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 what do I want to free love? What, what do I want the freeing of love, freeing our planet from destruction? Uh, how can I live my life in a way that can support the freeing of love for our planet? And what does that look like? I think those started to channel these, the eros, if you like, into creativity and into trying to manifest a better world. Um, and that's kind of where I've left it. And that, that's kind of where it is for me now and where I'm happy for it to stay. Um, unless I'm in an environment like that, I don't have the capacity to be able to um, handle that in a, in a powerful way. And just in 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 a, in a not just that, but the other thing that extreme that, that I found ex the the one thing for me from being in Tamara that I really liked because I'm a father and I've got kids was the way in which because you know this conversation about free love takes it to another level when you have kids and you're in and in your relationship with someone with whom you share kids with and with whom you share a home with and where you're economically dependent on one another. So when you're in a community and you have kids you know, the children will sleep in a children's room and one, for you know, one couple, one person for a week will put your kids to bed with other kids. Um, you don't talk about having childcare or a babysitter. You're not dependent on your partner to go out and just have alone time or free time. The community is holding that for you. The child has many uncles and aunts. In fact, they also are like surrogate mothers and fathers. Um, you know, they, 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 they kind of live in forest school. You don't take your kid in the car and drive to forest school. You're living in forest school. 
it's so so what that does it completely alleviates the pressure of the couple or the relationship to be so codependent on one another in order to be able to go on that journey and explore these really powerful energies because it's been held by that community so that's something that i felt that's really landed in me um moving forward so that's kind of where i'm at on that one for now um i'd like to bring to yeah, I wanted to Don't actually leave something too. Yeah, just a shift as well around. I know we have about what twenty minutes on the conversation, yeah. and in terms of the filmmaking process, I do want to highlight one of my favorite moments uh, of the filmmaking process, which involves you, Mark. And uh, I mean, it really was around you coming into a project that you know we had a bit of a swirl of, you know, trying to figure out what's this film about, what's the central line uh, that that I, I can't remember the name of it. Controlling idea, right? That was the phrase that you used. What's the controlling idea of this? And you know, getting together and trying different uh, perspectives. We had Julia as the main narrator, right, for a time, uh, because we're like, we need somebody to inhabit the main perspective. And ultimately, that's where uh, you gave us the insight to peel along apart again and have uh, Julia really empowered to continue on in her own film, which was named earlier, The Intimate Revolutions. And also, there was a sense that you you were kind of bridging the world of, well, this is how it is normally done, right, in terms of uh, uh, professional production with deadlines and you know all this kind of stuff, and then there was the tension of, but we were following this different uh, arc or this different intelligence, right, of of the process, and it, it was already named actually earlier with uh, Sabina. Uh, she confessed, you know, and she even told us too at the time that years into this project, right, where Tamara had been kind of leaning in to say, okay, when's this when's this film going to be ready? When's this film? And we're like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, and then we'd hit another dead end or get you know in the swamp. And Sabina was saying, you know, I gave up actually on whether this film would ever come out. And I just remember there's one moment when I think you found the same kind of um, swamp that we were in with us. And, you know, John, uh, in his, you know, impassioned, um, you know, heartfelt way, <laughs> I mean, saying, you know, I just, I really want this to be a professional production. That's what I want, the professional production. And then I think your response, Mark, was just, this is the furthest thing from a professional production. It's the exact opposite <laughs> of a professional production. Uh, <laughs> and it was just such a great moment of this tension, right? Of you trying to essentially haul us out of the, you know, creative, uh, you know, morass or whatever into, okay, but also you need deadlines and also you got to whip this into shape. And then the sense that we were trying to follow a kind of pace of, you know, where does Eros want to take us? And like, how do we do that? And, you know, the, the balance between those things really necessary in order to actually get something to completion and out the door. Mm, yes uh yeah they were somewhat challenging times uh, <laughs> but again it was a you know it's you said about Tamara being a 50-year research um project you know that's my that was my fear that the film was also going to become a 50-year research project not <laughs> a included film because you were embodying the experience in a very loyal way so I think it was about balancing that truth that you were holding in yourself but also finding a way to apply that in a it you know in trying to make a film because films are so hard to make and they're extremely reductive mediums. I mean, they're not like books. You can't like you have to. It's all about taking ninety percent of the information out and then finding a way to convey it in a really succinct way. And that's really really hard to do. The more immersed you are and passionate about the the the, the myriad of elements in an issue and a subject matter um but faithfully you you all got there uh you all got there in the end so yeah mm. it's great that you 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 persevered to the end and i i just want to say something about timing as well and i know there's a couple more comments coming in which is great um i just want to name it's interesting to track timing because you know again we had a thrust around the 2019 that was our last crowdfunder that was our last time to tamara and we really had this like okay well i think it was you know we'll finish by the end of the year let's get it out and again hitting these kind of roadblocks of like, wow, how do we tell this film? And then of course, COVID pandemic happened in early 2020. And of course, you know, unfolded for a year or two, two and a half years. And it just strikes me that again, imagine the film had come out like 2020, beginning of COVID. We had that thought 2020, that's the year of vision. Right. And, uh, and all of a sudden we're in the midst of a global pandemic and the, the message of community, you know, proximity, Close together was, I mean, the exact opposite of what everywhere was telling us. Most places were telling us, separate, you know, stay apart, <laughs> don't look at your neighbor, you know. And it was such a, 
I, I'm so glad in a way that quote it took this long. And for me, it just feels like there's is some kind of you know intelligence at work of like you know it's not quite the right timing. You know, it's not quite the right timing. And we went all the way back to the very uh, foundations. If you right that moment when Julia uh, was empowered to go on her journey, and we went right to the very foundations, even called the film the Sacred Matrix, and we rebuilt it with a script for the first time. That Mark was like, "You need a script. Stop trying to do it without a script." And we're like, "But we could do it without a script." No, you can't. And uh, we we started with the script, and we rebuilt the foundations to get to what the film Village of Lovers became. And thankfully, Julia is is quite far along in her process now too. But again, just the mysteriousness of Eros and the timing. I mean, I'm still struck by that. Mm, absolutely. I'd like to bring in some of the comments in the chat room. Some of these we've now spoken to. Um, there's some beautiful comments here. One from Marielle. It takes freeing the love for myself to hold the space for freeing love in merge with other beings. Um, and I think that's something that I got from my experience uh, as well, is just recognizing the work I need to do to deeply love myself and transform that in a really positive, healthy way. Um, let's see what else we got now. Um, Ju Julie Hughes, I think it's vital to take the step towards free love very slowly and with support, that if we rush into it, we risk facing old trauma patterns and going outside the zone of tolerance within a relationship and causing more destruction than actual eros. Relationships in dominant culture currently live in very insular frameworks and the lack of a village really hinders our ability to step into deep attachment wounds and heal the personal collective wounding around deep trust. Absolutely, I, I really do share that, that, that sentiment. Thank you for for dropping that one in um let's scroll down a little bit more um there's a question that came in um just a couple of minutes ago about to what extent is this a youth project and how welcome are old people and if they're not able-bodied are they held by the village hmm. oh i'm just catching that now that's a very, uh, that's a great question. Can mm -hmm. someone speak to the elderly, um, how the elder, el the elders and the elderly um, are hand, uh, you know, how that, how they play into the life in Tamara? Well, I guess I'll just start and say that Tamara was founded in 1978 and two of the three founders are still alive and um, in the village. And there's a, group there of their peers that surround them that are also still there many are still there um and so I, I feel like the presence of elders is strong um you know I imagine that if one is not able-bodied fully it's not the most comfortable place to be um because of it's an eco village there's dirt roads there are um I yeah I I didn't see a lot of people who were not fully able-bodied there. Maybe you two have other experiences. Um, and there have been deaths and births at Tamara. So I know that there are rituals for how people pass. And I will say that one of the more remarkable experiences that I had in Tamara, especially at Love School, was witnessing the elders, not only in the forum, but also um, it was one very touching, they call it a, a matinee, like a, it's kind of like going to church on a Sunday. They have a big seminar hall and somebody gives a speech every Sunday morning. There was this one about um, one of the elder women speaking about being an erotic being and what it is to be an erotic elder woman in the community and the nuance of that and the contradiction of that as to what um, the dominant culture portrays as sexy and it fetishizes maidenhood. And so there's a real power that I find the, the elders of the community hold as really, really trusting and naming and embodying that Eros, and I'm, I'm not saying only sexuality, but including sexuality, Eros is in the, 
is part of life. And uh, Sabina Lichtenfels once said, like, you are erotic until you die. <laughs> and there's something that I love about that, that that field holds that as true and creates permission and visibility for that of all the generations. So something that touched me. Mm. And I don't know about the able-bodiedness, but I know that it's, yeah, not a com for from all the people I know who were born there, who live there, they say it's not a very comfortable place to live. It's very, very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. There's not always a hot shower. It's rough terrain. Like it's, the early days were definitely more tough. So I think that makes it limited to who is really able to be there. Just, just a reminder, though, that tomorrow as well, right, is a conversation that folks can join to Tamara now. And uh, then these kind of things too can be responded to directly from the current state. So it's a great place to bring some of these questions. And I'd say it's interesting on the question is that I think um, what makes Tamir also unique is that many echo villages around that time, the ones that still exist here are just full of old people and they've not been able to bring in youth. So in some ways for me, it's Tamir's ability to have to keep old people, but also bring in youth and also keep youth. Cause I don't know about you're all, um, you know, knowing people in their twenties and thirties, but a lot of people I know are very flighty, very prone to keep moving, perpetually always moving. And I've seen many people go to Tamara and be like, this is it. Cause they found something that actually feels holistic enough that can really integrate them um, and still meet the like diverse thirst of like life while really providing a home base. And I think that like that, um, that um, attraction field has, I think been able to really bring both young and old also like staying. And that's also necessary because as Julie's saying, the elders have a lot of the wisdom, but young people have, you know, the like good backs and bodies to go and like do some of the work that maybe the older folk can't do as well anymore. The last thing I'll say is that when I was there in 2018, there was somebody dying in the village. And that person had full-time care from within the village. Um, and I know that, you know, my mom was always like, your retirement, your retirement savings. Why aren't you making more, you know, like, and I was like, mom, community is my retirement plan. And I still trust in that, even though I don't live in that now. And that's a big system change from our culture that believes you have to save money and have these plans, have a, have a like 401k and that's great. And I think that's still, you know, there's bridges to be built, but I'm trying to build even my life now, a relational network where care can exist in a different kind of way. And I think that's also what Tamara is really modeling. Mm. Mm. Thank you, John. That's incredible. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I'd like to. I mean, I think I'm just looking at the chat here. The like a word diversity has just popped in, and I think I think that was posed in relation to the diversity of age. But the subject of diversity is uh, quite uh, an important one. I think in relation to Tamara. Um, the the and I think the film speaks to this, and I think it's great that you did this in the film. Is really um, speaking to the source and the origins of Tamara. Tamara is largely a German community, isn't it? I don't know what the percentage is, but is it not about 85% of the residents are a German? Less. A little bit less now, probably like 70 to 80, I'd say. Hmm. So you, <clears throat> so they've left Germany and they've gone to, um, they've found this land in Portugal. So they're immigrants. Um, so the culture is is a German culture, essentially. That's a big part of the culture is quite Germanic. Um, and it's a particular type of um, German culture as well because of the origins of where Sabina and... Help me. And... Dieter, Charlie and Dieter? Dieter come from, right? So it's Eastern, isn't it? Eastern Germany originally. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so, and, and, and when you understand about the origin story, um, in terms of fascism, um, and trying to, and understanding that somehow, um, that was permitted, um, because truth was not allowed to come forward. 
and how to make sure that that could never happen again is to um, essentially go in the opposite way and dismantle and question everything, um, absolutely everything. Um, and that led Sabina to walk out of her Christian conventional monogamous marriage into um, the community, the, the first community that they, they established, which was um, wild, uh, sexually wild. It became tamer when they got to Tamera. Um, so, you know, that that for me is what I started to realize as well, is that this, the, the backstory of Tamera is coming from a trajectory which is not my shared trajectory. And I'm in an environment and a certain level of societal ways of being and rules that that, that has that, that is it is German in that way. And that plays out into the fact that it's a dominant white culture. It's a dominant, um, it's a dominant elder culture. Um, and it doesn't reflect um, more of a modern day diverse cultural environment that you would find in many uh, Western urban environments that I'm familiar with. Um, so, you know, that is a big part of what Tamara is. Um, it's yet to be internationalized and diversified um, to the kind of level that I think that we're, we, we certainly, well, I do in those cities that I spend time in, in Europe, for example. Um, and that transition that that Tamara is undergoing uh, to make it relevant of what's happening on the outside, the degree to which it can diversify and attract um, a you know a variety of voices, um, I think is how will we'll, I think potentially determine its future of its its relevance and its future relevance. But Ian, do you, do you want to speak to that point? Yeah, um, and I again thank you for the comments and some of the uh, corrections coming mm -hmm. in around certain things. Yeah, um, Danny L here has said, "Fun fact: They did their first gay pride." event last year in 2023 look the comments are picking up now. yeah yeah i think it was um, 2022 actually because that's the footage we have that we've included in the film and for a long time made their lgbtqi plus community members feel that there was something wrong with them since that's i true. was there first in 200 the diversity is growing okay someone's saying the diversity is growing a lot correction dear is from the west as well Okay, so there are obviously some comments and strong feelings around this subject. Go and go ahead, Ian. How can we speak to that? Well, what I want to say then about the um, like how I perceive what they've achieved in the research is again one aspect around um, anyone who tries to get any number of people to do anything for any length of time knows how difficult it is actually because of everything that comes up. And uh, like John has said, and you know Julia um, as well on different iterations trying to apply many of these things, uh, you come up against all the things we've been talking about, you know, attachment trauma and the lack of solidarity, economic pressures, all these kind of things. And so for me, I recognize Tamara, not so much as like, this is the model that needs to be replicated on mass, right? Because then we have a question of scale. What is scalable? And uh, I remember I had a conversation with Daniel Schmachtenberger, actually, some may know, um, who's very interested in civilization research, right? He says, um, I think this is his, his sort of inquiry, but he, and he had seen elements of the film, or I think he might've even been to Tamara, but he had this real question of like, well, how does it scale? Um, and again, because there's not, you know, if everybody decided to go back to the land and build these little pods again, like that, you know, we're in trouble because um, a lot of the biodiversity has been depleted significantly in a lot of these areas, uh, as well as um, the resources needed to, I don't know, kind of, step outside of the city or the transport things. Like it's just, it's a different kind of question. But for me, what Tamara stands as such a, a model of is it's like a, a radical inquiry into a certain realm that needed to go as far out as they went in order to come back with these crystallizations of, of the research and the realizations. Now, how that actually applies on mass on scale in different uh, environments, like you've been talking about, like, you know, cities with hundreds of thousands of millions of people, like these are just interesting questions now in terms of the where where we go to next with this. 
and this goes all the way back to the beginning of the conversation where, or at least for me saying that the, you know, the, the transmission there is to teach people to long for the sea, like don't send them out for nails or do it like wood, because again, that can be a little, it can minimize or, or kind of, I don't know, distort the value of um, a kind of ignition of the possible, but then how that applies, like, we don't know. Um, you know, we, even they don't know. I mean, Benjamin and Sabine both said the recent events in Israel, Palestine has had them really just, you know, question it all. And they had to find their way back to a sense of willingness. And, and I wouldn't see hope per se, but the willingness to keep going in the face of even all the things that they've done. And so, I don't know, again, I see this as, this is the task then before all of us is, okay, so they've brought back these crystallizations of certain things, certain possibilities. And that now, how do we apply this? Like, this is the research that all of us are in now. And ultimately, I think this is, speak, does this not speak to the fact that they call themselves a biosphere one? So the, the other idea- a healing biotope one, yeah. Sorry, a healing biotope, not biosphere, a healing biotope one. So the, the ideology is that if one embodies all of the theories and ideas that you experience in Biotope 1 and take that to your own land and set up a similar system, it will create a morphic field, such a strong vibration of love that there will, would be world peace. I think that's I would, the... I would I would translate it slightly and say uh, they call them greenhouses of trust, right? So, and this is also where the noosphere comes into an understanding of when we catalyze possibility or crystallize, for example, this this ability to generate trust, uh, that that then becomes non locally accessible everywhere, right? And uh, you know, again, depending on where you sit with that science, it comes from Rupert Sheldrake, um, and that as we do the work, as we do forum here on Vancouver Island. Right, I've noticed how people get it much faster. Uh, and even when Yanka, who came from Tamara uh, this past summer in Oakland, when we did a gathering, she as well was like, "Wow, this people, you know, they're just picking it up." Um, and it took them years, you know, to get to certain places where uh, they're able to recognize how quickly uh, we we kind of onboard into the skillness, skillfulness, and the possibility. So again, that's for me a kind of. Um, a, a key understanding that it's not about setting up a kind of uh, a biotope specifically everywhere. I know that Dieter holds certain visionary ideas around these things, but for me, that can kind of get away from um, a, a sort of different, more biodiverse and unique mm -hmm. understanding of uh, what's possible to plant and how it may look different. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I also want to speak to the fact that the film, um, unfortunately, doesn't really provide a critical lens. So I think that that's why often a lot of these questions come up in Q and A's and it's great. It's, I think it's important to really ask, um, you know, what are the, 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 what's under the carpet, right? Like what are the things that maybe the pitfalls, maybe it's not quite the utopia. And um, while I didn't, I actually stepped, as Ian mentioned, stepped away from the last year and a half, kind of scripting final editing portion so um i can't speak to the choices made there but i do see also i do share a sense that um like for anyone who's seen for example wild wild country um who's you know a six-part netflix series about the osho community and set it up in oregon predominantly about the drama and the pain and the and the harm that was done throughout the years um very entertaining but I think that we felt clear as filmmakers that there are a lot of those kinds of stories, especially that then end up being entertainment. And um, as a filmmaker, I can say like, this is maybe it's a little bit more promotional of Tamara than most films in the, in the kind of classic documentary style. And yet there's something um, really honest. And I think we've, we've endeavored to transmit it here. Um, honestly, something very touching and very unique about this place and that the community, it's like we fell in love with each other. And so that that, that influenced our lens and um, we spoke to it earlier, there wasn't the access given to some of the things that weren't quite, uh, I guess to some of the shadows and then also I think it took 
quite a bit of time to really understand on a cellular level, like what is this about? I think that we could have maybe gone in quickly and done a critique or a, you know, an overview or something, but there was a deeper commitment to actually really, really trying to become in relationship with the subjects, um, with the participants of the film. And um, maybe in hindsight, we should have, we should have gone down that fork in the road when we thought to make a six part series or so, because there's, there's really so much to cover. And um there was a question about, is there going to be a sequel or a follow-up? And I can confidently say there probably will not be <laughs> because we've spent so much time on just this one. Here, but um, Here's the thing, yeah, not to ask filmmakers, just as a heads up, when when you're seeing a film from a filmmaker who's just finished something, finished something don't ask them immediately in the Q&A, what's next? What are you working on next? <laughs> uh, which comes up a lot. You'd be surprised. But you uh -huh. might have something up your sleeve. So maybe you want to talk about it. But it, it feels a bit like, you know, you finish 10 years into something and you're like, here it is. And they're like, yeah, that's great. What's next? Right? So I'm just saying, don't just don't do that. This is a good maybe. etiquette. For, yeah. Well, maybe the filmmakers who spend 10 years on a film just don't ever say the word film. Just keep it quiet. <laughs> Let's squeeze in one other little point here that's being mentioned, if we can, from Anna Estevez about community should not be compatible with a solid public welfare system. Otherwise, you can only build or join community if you're independently wealthy. I think you missed the line there saying uh, it is it needs to be compatible with the welfare system. Yeah, I think that's what I heard. Which, which oh, I, needs to be. Can we speak, can somebody speak to that briefly? This yeah, like I, 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 totally, I totally agree in that I think part of our research and also our learnings of trying to do a uh, community here in Canada and the um, US is it needs to be more integrated with the dominant system if it's really going to work. And I think Tamara is also finding that in their own uh, struggles in different ways. And in that sense, I have heard of places that are starting to get government funding to research community. And that I think that there's some bridge there, and I don't know all the steps of building that bridge, but there needs to be a place where, yes, we want to model and research alternative realities, but there is no alternative reality to the one reality of planet Earth, and we're on, and we're not going to be necessarily free of the larger government systems that we're like, and we can't go make, at this point, a sovereign nation within the U.S. without having a lot of problems. Um and I believe the, the bridge building is happening and it's possible. And that's honestly, it's a more humble path because it means having a partner with a lot of different peoples and energies that maybe we've outcast as our alternative uh, folks. As you know, for me, like it would be a thing to start learning how to uh, relate more with like Trumpers in my country. It's, but yet those are the bridges that need to be built if the larger global picture is actually going to change. So I just totally um, agree with what Anna is um, saying. I think that this cannot just be a ultra leftist, like uh, independently wealthy thing. This has to become something that bridges for all people. And there's a lot of work. And that's going to also look different, I think, in each local place. So I want to say that um, as well. Thank you. And maybe, Mark, can I just actually ask something of our audience here? Yeah, um, go for it. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, all of you, for being here. And thank you for supporting us. And in this moment when the film is out live, and this is us, as you probably heard, trying to do this because life is leading us not through Netflix, not through some big, you know, like film contract, but really using the power of community, of our networks to get the word out. And I think one of the best ways to support this movement is to share the film with people that you love, like directly in texts or emails, of course, sharing it on social uh, media. But there's something that happens. The point of a film or a book or any piece of media is to help create a certain level of coherence, not as an ending point, but a starting point for a different kind of conversation. It's such a different conversation if people have all seen the film or all read that book. So we would be greatly uh, supported by you sharing it with people that you love and starting that conversation. And we have also started an online school 
community where we might not do an, we might not do a series, we might not do another film, but we can, for instance, maybe host Danielle's seven part web series there. And we can host other behind the scenes content and we can bring in articles and we have an online course there and we're going to put replays at the summit there. And mostly what we want is to globally create a network of people researching this path so that we can be feedbacking and dialoguing and having more of a evolutionary process by our connection there. So that place is free to join. Um, there's a link somewhere else in the chat I can try to find and add it. Um, also, but those are super great ways to take next steps with us and bring your own wisdom. We, we want to hear from you, what you are learning in your own path of research in this. Um, yeah. in there. Um, and I just want to speak to, I'm just loving the comments in the chat and, um, yeah. And, and this comment from, from Ana Margarita um that there's a lot of social questions that need to be addressed and i couldn't agree more i think that there are many questions from tamara that if you can take their courses if you can go there if you can find out for yourself danielle posted a seven episode web series that you made amazing i can't wait to watch and also to say that just what john said there is a a, a wish and an invitation if you have your own research, if you have your own questions, your own publications to please share, like let's all each do our part to, to question. I think that there's, there's wisdom in questioning. Um, there's been so much uh, that has been conditioned that we have been conditioned to believe as normal that it, that it, we would be, it would behoove us to question. I think to because we're we're going fast in a in a direction on this planet that that is not looking good. So surely the people who endeavor to um, to do things are imperfect, and let's let's do let's iterate, let's learn from each other's mistakes. Hmm. Thank you. I think we should. So, yeah. I think we should start winding this down when we switch this off the chat room disappears i'm just wondering if we should just give it a minute or two if we can if yeah. anyone wants to we can, uh, we can leave the room open if people want to look at the comments and stuff once the conversation a whole variety of links and things and further information that's being shared from various different people um this isn't just a film, this is more than a film. And um, let's just think, what, what are your hopes if someone can speak to that about next steps? You've made a huge effort to make the film, a huge effort to get the film out there and to provoke conversations around it. What would, what's the next steps that you would like us to take um, tomorrow? Should we all individually go out and set out our helium biotypes and have those ready for in a couple of years time? What, what's, what's the plan guys? <laughs> <laughs> Are you in, are you yeah. trying to evangelize Tamara Mark? Is no, no, not at all. Happening? No, seriously, no, no, genuinely. What would you like? What What's the outcome you would like? What What? Or have you got this follow up material? Yeah. Okay. Tell us about the summit. Tell I'm us about to find out more. If we want to dig deeper, give us some final pointers, please. I can say one more thing, which is. We, our first goal is to get this film seen by as many people as possible. We're also seeking connections to influencers or celebrities to get the film in front of them. Because the thing I think about with this film that to me has really been touching is that no matter who it is on planet Earth, whether it's a president of somewhere or this famous movie star or just your neighbor, I think everyone is longing for community at some level. And I think that it's the one thing that all the power and all the money in the world can't actually buy you or just get you at that level. So I'd love for this film to also be seen by those kind of people that can help it spread in other like ways. Um, and I think that, you know, we're really hoping that the soil of community as global consciousness really builds so that more community projects like Tamara and the myriad of ways from urban to rural um, can really grow. We think that so happens through the continued dialogue, whether that's with us in school, that's with us on Facebook. Um, 
And I think beyond that, please just reach out. We would love to be um, in touch. Ian, is there anything you want to add? Having been at the helm with me for the last little bit here. Uh, I would just love to highlight that this is an emergent unfolding. And one of the major paradigm shifts is happening is that we, the collective response needed to these times will not come top down. That doesn't mean no involvement from top down. It just means that the, the hierarchical structures of control and sort of directing what we could do, it's just, they're clearly not up to the task. It's, it's this, the level of complexity requires a, a kind of um, yeah, emergent locality that is specific to you, right? Where you are and how you want to, uh, contribute and bring your gifts. Uh, and so this that's the encouragement there. And at the same time with this particular summit, yes, again, to to if you could take a moment, share the links with, you know, the, the key people in your life, you're like, you know what, you really should see this. It's important. Um, this matters a lot to us to grow the amount of people that see this and get uh, ignited and activated and passionate and also that can contribute to this 10-year effort um, financially as well took a lot of funds to put on this uh, summit as well. You know, all our speakers are being paid. That was important to us. And um, and yet it was from this place of trust and faith that this matters uh, as, a, as a contribution to the unfolding of this time, just in the way that we could and and bring the story of Tamara. So um, any way that you feel inspired to participate in that, that's authentic, that's true. It just really helps us. Uh, we can't understate that enough. So again, thevillageoflovers.com. Uh, villagerlovers.com slash summit, you know, for others, we send them there, but it all helps a lot. Thanks for your time today, everyone leaning in. Thanks, Mark, for uh, giving your time and directing this conversation and being with us in the creative cauldron for so long. Um, and uh, yeah, what a magical moment. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. You. Thank you, everyone, for this. We we need these conversations as, as often as possible uh this is this is really what this is for our time so congratulations to you all for your commitment to bringing this into being um and following following your vision and if you guys want to just drop in your contact information in the chat now um if anyone wants to follow up with you um and put your website details or personal things guys drop 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 it in uh for for anyone who wants to follow up at a later date um anyway it's uh, 11.15 at night for me, and I should be heading off to bed. Good night, everyone, and God bless. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.